Hello and welcome live from New Delhi. You're watching DD India News R, India's voice to the world. I'm Gautam Roy, and coming up in the next hour, India supports the Philippines in upholding its national sovereignty, says External Affairs Minister Dr. S. J. Shankar, amid the Southeast Asian nation's maritime dispute with China in the South China Sea. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu cancels high-level Israeli delegation's planned visit to Washington D.C. after the U.S. abstains from the U.N. resolution calling for Gaza ceasefire. Former U.S. President Donald Trump's hush money trial is set to begin on the 15th of April. The verdict is likely before he faces voters in November. And New Zealand joins the U.S. and the U.K. in charging China. For state-sponsored cyber attacks, its government raises the matter of a hacking attempt on its parliament in 2021 with Chinese counterparts. Well, first up, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has officially cancelled an Israeli delegation's visit to the White House this week. In a post on social media platform X, the Prime Minister's office said the decision was made in light of the change in the U.S. position. The U.S. decision to abstain on the vote prompted Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu to cancel to cancel a scheduled trip to the U.S. by two of his top advisers. The U.S. abstention on Monday's vote allowed the latest resolution on Gaza to pass. When the other 14 members of the 15th Strong Council voted yes, the resolution put forward by the 10 non-permanent members of the Security Council demands an immediate ceasefire for the month of Ramadan, the immediate and unconditional release of hostages, and the urgent need to expand the flow of aid into Gaza. And the White House said it was very disappointed by the decision of the Israeli PM. National Security Council spokesperson John Kirby said the Biden administration is kind of perplexed by Netanyahu's decision to cancel a planned Israeli delegation's visit to Washington to discuss alternatives to an attack of the southern Gaza city of Rafah after the U.S. abstained on a U.N. ceasefire resolution. Also, State Department spokesperson Matthew Miller said Netanyahu's statement was a bit surprising and unfortunate. There were issues where that we had concern, uh, issues with which we had concerns related to that resolution. The fact that it did not condemn Hamas's terrorist attacks of October 7th. That's why we didn't uh, vote for it. But the reason we didn't veto it is because there were also things in that uh, resolution that were consistent with our long-term uh, position. Most importantly, that there should be a ceasefire and that there should be a release of hostages, which is what we understood also to be the government of Israel's position. So uh, it is a bit surprising and unfortunate that they are not going to apparently attend these meetings. Israel's Defense Minister Yav Gallant has said that Israel could not end the conflict with Hamas while there are still hostages in Gaza. The Israeli Defense Minister is on a visit to the U.S., where he is expected to meet his counterpart Lloyd Austin, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken, and other senior U.S. officials. We have no moral right to stop the war while there are still hostages held in Gaza. The lack of a decisive victory in Gaza may bring us closer to a war in the north. We will operate against Hamas everywhere, including in places where we have not been yet. We will identify an alternative to Hamas so that the IDF may complete its mission. And a veteran Israeli minister who joined Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's emergency unity government after Hamas's 7th of October attacks resigned on Monday. Gideon Saar, who joined the unity government along with several other members of the opposition to help manage the conflict, says he was not being included in the highest-level war cabinet. Saar's departure, along with another of his allies, Is not expected to affect the stability of Netanyahu's government, which still controls a clear majority in parliament. So there's heavy turbulence over Gaza and the UNSC resolution between the Americans and the Israelis. Let's take you across to Dili, India, Sarah Coates in Tel Aviv for more on this. Uh, hi, Sarah. Now, Israel has made its displeasure evident 
over the American abstention which allowed the UNSC ceasefire resolution to pass. Now, why is Israel so angry? Hello there. This certainly leaves Israel very, very isolated on the world stage. Israel now feels abandoned. And we heard this from the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu shortly after that resolution passed. He came out to say that the U.S. has abandoned its policy in the U.N. and this harms the war effort and also the effort to bring these hostages back. Now, shortly after that decision was made, after that was passed, uh, Netanyahu very swiftly cancelled this delegation's visit to Washington. And this was actually requested by President Biden last week. These people were supposed to go there to discuss this potential operation down in the southernmost Gazan city of Rafah, where some 1.3 million internally displaced Palestinians are sheltering. And this was an area that was, of course, declared as a safe zone. And it is an operation which the U.S. is declaring a red line, a mistake. We've heard this from both Biden and the Vice President Kamala Harris. She came out just a couple of days ago to say that she has studied these maps and there is literally nowhere for these displaced people to go. But certainly on the ground, it seems as though not much is actually changing since this resolution was passed. There are still heavy airstrikes right across the Strip, including reports of airstrikes down in Rafa itself, where, as I said, many, many people are sheltering. Right, now, what sort of shift is this? For the U.S. in its overall support for Israel in the battle against the Hamas, can it have wider implications in the quest for peace, uh, whether it's temporary or uh, otherwise in Gaza? It certainly shows the depth of this rift between Israel and Washington, the United States really removing Israel's diplomatic uh, immunity there, diplomatic protection. Washington, though, says that this is not a shift in policy. Senior US officials uh, came out shortly after this resolution passed saying that they warned Israel over the weekend that they may in fact abstain rather than veto this resolution. We also heard from the national security spokesperson John Kirby. He said that the US will continue to have Israel's back and also push for the release of hostages. But really this rift is getting more and more public. Uh, Joe Biden's frustration with Israel, with Netanyahu becoming more and more public. What we really are seeing here is a sort of a warning shot fired by the US at Israel, uh, really sort of saying, take some notice or this might be more of what you see. But in saying all of this, uh, despite this rift, what we do need to remember is the US is Israel's closest ally and money talks. Uh, the United States is still giving Israel a lot of support, $3.5 billion annually, in fact, and that is uh, for the supply of weapons. So certainly this could be something that is considered uh, to stop this supply if Israel actually doesn't start towing the U.S.'s line. All right, let's see which way it goes then. Uh, thanks a lot for joining us, Sarah Coates, for the time being. Uh, families of hostages held by Hamas in Gaza on Monday said their loved ones should be released before a ceasefire in the Palestinian enclave. India's external affairs minister Dr. S. J. Shankar on Tuesday reiterated uh, the country's support uh, to Philippines in upholding its national sovereignty. Dr. J. Shankar was interacting with the media in Manila with his Filipino counterpart Enrique Manalo. I take this opportunity to firmly reiterate India's support to the Philippines for upholding its national sovereignty. As the world changes, it is essential that countries like India and the Philippines cooperate more closely to shape the emerging order. Underscoring new areas of cooperation including defence and security, the External Affairs Minister noted that India and the Philippines are committed to maritime security. Dr. Jay Shankar is on a three-day visit to the Philippines as part of his Southeast Asia tour. We are both important maritime nations. We are not only important maritime nations, I think as the Secretary pointed out, we are at you know, two, 
two ends, in a manner of speaking, of the Indo-Pacific. Not exactly ends, but let's say Philippines is in the middle, we are at one end. Uh, it's also a fact that we are two nations who make a very exceptional commitment to global shipping. So every country has an interest in maritime security, in maritime safety, is probably it is more than many other countries normally would have. Earlier, Dr. Jay Shankar held a meeting with his counterpart, uh, Enrique Manalo in Manila. India's external affairs minister said that the two democracies are committed to a rules-based order and he looked forward to intensifying ties. Also in a social media post, the minister noted that wide-ranging discussions on politics, defense, security and maritime cooperation, trade and investment, infrastructure, development cooperation, education, digital technology, culture and consular domains were held between the leaders. The external affairs minister said that the two leaders also exchanged views on global, regional and multilateral issues including the Indo-Pacific, ASEAN, West Asia, Ukraine, NAM and the United Nations. High Commissioner of India and Sri Lanka, in partnership with the Sri Lankan Ministry of Technology, organized a conference on digital public infrastructure, that's DPI, in Colombo. The conference aims to explore the transformative potential of DPI for enabling service delivery, empowering communities by fostering inclusivity and enriching the economy by driving innovation. Sri Lankan President Ranul Vikramasinghe delivered the keynote address during the opening plenary session of the conference. Vikram Singh spoke about his country's plans to strengthen digital infrastructure. He also thanked the Indian government for its help. I must also thank the Indian government for uh, enabling us to have a uh, campus of the Chennai IIT. In addition to it, the government is also planning to start three universities, of which two will have uh, emphasis on technology and one will be a university of technology. So that is the background we have together with the other institutions that will be started at different levels. So in implementing it, we needed help. And the best place we could get was India. So I spoke with Prime Minister Modi when I was there last year. And as a part of our integration, we said we'd like to go with India. You have done so much. And another reason I took India is the country that discovered zero. The conference focuses on how DPI simplifies governance and improves accessibility for citizens. The Indian High Commissioner to Sri Lanka, Santosh Jha, spoke about India's Aadhaar system, saying it facilitates the financial inclusion of the underprivileged of society. Probably even the architects of Aadhaar didn't envisage that India was on a path to finding a world-beating solution for building out and regulating the online commons that is more equitable than the laissez-faire approach, more transparent and more innovative that, than some of the regulation-heavy models. Today, Aadhaar covers more than 1.3 billion of our people. We have used the power of the Jan Trinity Jandhan bank accounts, Aadhaar and mobile to revolutionize financial inclusion in India. And still to come on DD India News R. A crucial make or break day for WikiLeaks founder Junior Assange in London's High Court. Part of a three kilometer long bridge in Maryland's Baltimore collapses after a cargo ship collides with it. And Pakistan's second largest naval air base in Balochistan comes under an armed terror attack. Wherever news breaks, whatever it takes. Connecting corners, cutting across continents. Stories that matter from across the globe. Accurate, authentic journalism that serves you right. From politics to glamour, from sports to world affairs, 
with a fusion of aesthetics and substance. Introducing news in a new avatar. Experience the world through a new lens. Stay tuned to DD India for an exciting journey beyond borders. Welcome back. You're watching DD India News. I'm Gautam Roy. WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange will find out on Tuesday whether the High Court in London will allow him to appeal against his extradition from Britain to the United States or if his British legal challenges have finally come to an end. US prosecutors are seeking to put Assange on trial on 18 counts relating to WikiLeaks' high-profile release of vast troves of confidential US military records and diplomatic cables. Assange's legal battles in Britain began in 2010 and he subsequently spent seven years holed up in Ecuador's embassy in London before he was dragged out and jailed in 2019 for breaching bail conditions. He has been held in a maximum security jail in South East London ever since. Well, let's get you more on this uh, with DD India's Oli Barra joining us straight from London. Good afternoon to you, Oli. How crucial is uh, today's hearing for uh, the WikiLeaks founder? Is it absolutely his last resort to avoid being extradited to the US? Not quite. If uh, the ruling comes down in favour of Julian Assange, then he will be allowed to proceed with an appeal. This is a decision that is being handed down by the court after a two-day hearing last month. If the hearing and the ruling goes against him, it does mean that he has exhausted his options in the UK court system, but there would still be the possibility of Julian Assange and his legal team uh, then reaching towards the European Court of Human Rights. And I think that is something that we would expect that they would do. So if the ruling goes against Julian Assange today, he would have a period uh, of around two weeks to make the decision about whether to make that application to the Euro European court system. But it would mean, if the ruling goes against him today, that all of his options in the UK court system have been exhausted. So uh, this is despite the fact that the UK is out of the EU, but uh, uh, the European court uh, is still an appellate uh, court for uh, uh, any sort of a proceeding uh, where uh, no uh, relief has been granted in the UK courts? That's right. The UK is still a signatory to the European Court of Human Rights, the European Convention uh, on Human Rights. That's a matter of some controversy here in Britain. Some conservative UK MPs believe that the UK should pull out of that arrangement, but for now uh, it remains within it. So that does mean that that is uh, Julian Assange's remaining option if the ruling goes against him today. When we had the two-day hearing uh, earlier this month, we got a pretty good sense of the legal arguments on both sides um, of this. For Julian Assange, um, his uh, lawyers described this as a legally unprecedented prosecution. Um, they believe that extradition would be in breach of the extradition treaty between the UK and the United States, which prohibits extradition for political offences, which they believe this should count as. Um, Julian Assange was responsible, according to his uh, legal team in, in the two-day hearing last month, um, for the exposure of criminality on the part of the US government. Um, and it also says that state retaliation uh, has been motivating the United States prosecution. So we've We've had some very strong words indeed from his legal team who believe that he would be denied justice and potentially in danger if he were to be extradited to the United States. From the US side, again, very strong words indeed from the American legal team in that hearing earlier this month. Um, uh, Judy, James Lewis, who was uh, on the US side uh, uh, as one of the lawyers, said that he wasn't just prosecuted for publish, publish, uh, publishing these documents, but for, in the words of the American legal team, aiding and abetting or conspiring with the whistleblower Chelsea uh, Manning. The American legal team also criticizes Julian Assange for the publication of all of these documents without names of some individuals redacted, which they say put in grave danger uh, individuals related to some of these uh, diplomatic cables. So that's how some of these legal arguments played out over this two-day hearing. Um, and we will get the uh, result handed down from uh, judges in uh, a little bit over an hour and a half or so from now. And um, as I say, 
day, that's when we'll know whether Julian Assange has to potentially look towards the European courts as his final option. I guess at the end of the day, it will come down to who will uh, be able to establish uh, the criminality on the other party's part. Uh, thanks a lot for joining us for the moment, Oli Barrett. A 2.57 kilometer long key bridge in Marin's Baltimore in the United States collapsed into the water after a cargo ship collided with it on Tuesday morning. Live video posted on YouTube showed a ship hitting the bridge, after which major portions of the spans collapsed into the Patapsco River. Maryland's Transportation Authority said that all lanes were closed in both directions and traffic is being diverted. No immediate casualties have been reported, although there have been reports of uh, uh, cars being on the bridge uh, that uh, fell into the river and people being caught up uh, in this uh, tragedy, a uh, very strange and bizarre tragedy indeed, and uh, that rescue efforts are still underway. Now, U.S. and British officials on Monday filed charges, imposed sanctions and accused Beijing of a sweeping, sweeping cyber espionage campaign. Uh, Deputy Prime Minister Oliver Dowden on Monday accused Chinese hackers of trying to break into email accounts of British lawmakers who were critical of China and said a separate Chinese entity was behind a hack of its electoral watchdog that comp compromised millions of people's data. In response to the attempted hack in 2021, Britain imposed sanctions on two people and one company linked to state-backed Chinese hacking group APT31. Britain also said an unidentified Chinese state-affiliated hacking group was behind a separate 2021-2022 cyber attack on Britain's electoral commission. I can confirm today that Chinese state-affiliated actors were responsible for two malicious cyber campaigns targeting both our democratic institutions and parliamentarians. First, the compromise of the United Kingdom Electoral Commission between 2021 and 2022, which was announced last summer. And second, attempted reconnaissance activity against UK parliamentary accounts in a separate campaign in 2021. And then the New Zealand government has said it has raised concerns with the Chinese government about its involvement in a state-sponsored cyber hack on New Zealand's parliament in 2021, which was uncovered by the country's intelligence services. New Zealand's Foreign Minister Winston Peters said in a statement that uh, foreign interference of this nature is unacceptable and we have urged China to refrain from such activity in future. The revelations that information was accessed through malicious cyber activity targeting New Zealand's parliamentarian entities comes as Britain and the US have accused China of a widespread cyber espionage campaign. And China, for its part, has uh, refuted these allegations and uh, said it will take diplomatic action against these accusing countries. Now, Belgian farmers have, uh, are expected to protest uh, with tractors in Brussels during a meeting of EU agriculture ministers hoping to calm anger sparked by in multiple EU countries about environmental standards seen as too strict and foreign imports. Ishan Garg tells us more from Brussels. For the third time this year, tractors have rolled onto Brussels streets. Tuesday's protest comes just as agriculture ministers of the European Union are meeting in Brussels. Farmers' unions say despite recent concessions made by European officials, they are still being treated unfairly. The EU has recently watered down some of its environmental norms for the agriculture sector to reduce the burden on the farmers. But protesters say that only benefits some richer farmers. They're asking the EU for more subsidies in a way that increases their profitability. They're also against the bloc's trade policies, which they allege could flood European markets with cheaper imports. This comes just a day after New Zealand announced that its FDA with the EU will come into force in May. The EU is currently working on another trade deal with Latin American countries, including agricultural powerhouses Brazil and Argentina. Farmers say it could render the small agri-businesses in the EU uncompetitive. 
For months, farmers across the 27-nation bloc have been holding demonstrations against their national government policies and also against the EU's green laws. As the June European Parliament elections approach, far-right parties are expected to capitalize on the farmers' anger. Now, EU officials say they are committed to improving conditions for farmers, but the protesters argue EU's policies haven't gone far enough in ensuring they get a fair price for their produce. Ashan Garg in Brussels reporting for DD India. And farmers in Britain have protested in London on Monday over food imports. A convoy of tractors drove outside Britain's parliament to protest against the post-Brexit trade deals and substandard food imports in the latest demonstrations by farmers globally. Farmers with Union Jack flags and signs such as No Farmers, No Food, No Future were demanding that the government should take steps to improve the country's food security. The rally follows protests by farmers across Europe who are angered by competition from cheaper imports and want stricter environmental regulations. Closer home to India, Pakistan's second largest naval air base in Balochistan has come under an armed terrorist attack. The Majid Brigade of the banned Balochistan Liberation Army has claimed responsibility for the assault. The militants attacked Pakistan naval air base in which at least one parliamentary soldier was killed while Pakistani security forces killed all five of the assailants in retaliatory fire. Monday's attack on the Tharwad base was the second assault by Baloch militants on a military facility in the past one week. Pakistan's Prime Minister Shahbaz Sharif's office termed the attack as escaped from huge loss. The BLA has previously been involved in attacks on Pakistani and Chinese interests in the region and elsewhere. Now let's get you some more updates from around the world as well. South Korea has laid out plans to support the domestic production of urea in order to prevent the repeated shortages of the organic compound from China. South Korea is heavily reliant on Chinese urea. This had led to a nationwide shortage in South Korea when China had temporarily suspended urea exports last year. A political newcomer among youth, Senegal's president-elect Basiru Diome Fai has promised to govern with humility and transparency. Provisional results showed Fai with about 53.7% and Amadou Ba from the current ruling coalition with 36.2% based on tallies from 90% of polling stations in the first round votes. The Caribbean nation Haiti is still in the, the grip of widespread gang violence as armed gangs set fire to several vehicle garages in the country's capital, Port-au-Prince. According to local media, at least 100 cars parked in several garages were set on fire by armed gangs on Sunday night. The arson attacks also targeted mattress and furniture warehouses as well as building housing a local court. And still to come on DD India News R. Donald Trump's lawyers failed to delay the start of his trial in the Stormy Daniels hush money case. The Congress party is on the back foot over its leader's derogatory remarks against BJP candidate and actor Kangana Ranaut. An Indian politician K. Kavitha is uh, sent to jail till the 9th of April after her enforcement directorate custody ended today in the Delhi excise case. India that invents. India that innovates. India that excites. India that invites. Land of possibility. Teeming with opportunities. Watch India Ideas. Each Thursday, 8 p.m. only on DD India. Welcome back. You're watching DD India News R. I'm Gautam Broy. Before we go any further, another look at some of our top stories. 
India supports the Philippines in upholding its national sovereignty, says External Affairs Minister Dr. S.J. Shankar, amid the Southeast Asian nation's maritime dispute with China in the South China Sea. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu cancels high-level Israeli delegation's planned visit to Washington, D.C. after the U.S. abstains from U.N. resolution calling for Gaza ceasefire. And New Zealand joins the U.S. and the U.K. in charging China for state-sponsored cyber attacks. Its government raises the matter of her hacking attempt on its parliament in 2021 with Chinese counterparts. Now, former U.S. President Donald Trump's criminal hush money case is set to go to trial from the 15th of April. The former president's legal team wanted the trial dropped or substantially delayed after federal investigators released a batch of documents they deemed relevant to the case. But in a win for Trump, his bond in a separate civil case has been substantially reduced by millions of dollars. William Denzel reports from New York. Donald Trump and his legal team headed to court here in Lower Manhattan on Monday, hoping uh, that the criminal case he faces uh, tied to allegations that he paid hush money to a porn star in the lead up to the 2016 presidential election would be dismissed or at least the trial would be substantially delayed. March 25th was originally the date planned for that trial to begin. However, uh, recently, a little earlier this month, the judge delayed it by 30 days. This came after a huge tranche of court documents were released by uh, federal investigators. Now, Donald Trump's team said that the handling and the late release of these documents were grounds for the case to be dismissed. The judge didn't see things that way. Instead, he decided to keep uh, his ruling as it was after his initial revision, which means that April 15th will be the first time, uh, will be the first of Donald Trump's four criminal cases that he faces to go to trial. Donald Trump has denied wrongdoing in those counts, pleading not guilty to all 34 felonies that he faces in that regard. However, he was granted somewhat of a win on Monday. Recently, Donald Trump was ordered to pay around $450 million after he was found liable for fraud. However, an appeals court here in New York has ruled that instead of having to pay at that amount, he now has to pay just a $175 million bond while his appeal continues. Donald Trump has 10 days to make that payment. He says he will do. He has railed against these cases here in New York, as well as the various other uh, civil and criminal cases that, that he faces. He says that it's election interference, and he says it's essentially a product of the justice system becoming weaponized to hurt his re-election campaign. William Denslow in New York reporting for DD India. Well, the key question is, with all this happening, does it have any bearing, possibly any kind of a fallout for Donald Trump's bid to become the President of the United States again? To answer that, well, all-important question really is Dr. Rajan Kumar with us, uh, School of International Studies at the Jawaharlal Nehru University. Dr. Kumar, what do you make of what's happening with Donald Trump and his legal troubles? One of the case, a criminal case, coming to a trial in April, much ahead of November, the 5th of November when America votes. Uh, thank you, Gautam, for having me here. Uh, this is a very important case, uh, although there are three other cases which are, uh, in, in terms of political consequences, uh, far important than this case. Uh, there are four criminal charges. One is this one, Hashmani case. The second one is the transfer of power and the capital uh, rights that uh, happened uh, in 2020, uh, 2021. And the third is about the Florida case, where he kind of kept the classified documents. And the fourth one is about uh, Georgia case, uh, where he tried to influence the decision of Georgia election. But this one is important because it is starting next month. Now, the, the court is saying that the trial will begin uh, on April 15. Uh, so, which means and the trial will continue for roughly six weeks uh, and in somewhere uh, in May. Uh, much will depend upon uh, the decision uh, given by the jury. As you know, the American system is uh, run by the American judicial system where the uh, jury decides and that there would be I think, you know, 12 jury, uh, jurors, uh, jury members uh, in that jury. And uh, depending on what decision they take, uh, uh, that would decide the fate of uh, Trump. Uh, theoretically, uh, he, he, even if he is convicted, he can continue 
uh, to run the campaign. He can uh, continue, continue to be the president, even if he goes to prison. So that's all. That's theoretical possibility. But once the, he's convicted and if he's... Uh, if, if he goes to jail, and jail term can be for four years. So that would be extremely difficult situation for the voters and his uh, campaign uh, prospects. Uh, so uh, in my view, you know, uh, depends a lot upon what uh, the way trial proceeds, uh, and the way uh, whether he's convicted or not, and even if he's convicted, whether he's sent to prison or not. So these are the important issues on which uh, his campaign and his presidency will depend. But thirdly, as I told you, he may, he may be, become, he may remain the president. He may rule uh, America even from the jail. So, uh, because conviction, according to the U.S. laws, even if you're convicted, that does not stop you from becoming a president. That's the law. And as you know, he has been indicted in number of cases. Uh, interesting thing is that uh, you know this is a criminal uh, trial, which means that he has to be present in the courtroom. In the civil cases, he does not have to be present in the courtroom. Uh, he could uh, he could have sent his one of his legal representatives, but in this particular case, he has to be present in uh, during his trial in Manhattan, which is New York. Uh, so that also kind of you know hinders his uh, campaign trail. Uh, he uh, during the days of trial, he may not be uh, campaigning in other places, uh, at least in the daytime. Uh, so these are the important possibilities. One important development which has taken place as far as Hashmani trial is concerned, and as you know, Hashmani trial is the case where uh, he tried to do a cover-up, where uh, the allegation is that he paid to lawyer uh, Cohen, who was a lawyer at that point of time, uh, to kind of you know silence the voice of uh, this uh, the porn actor, uh, this uh, Stormy Daniels. Right. Uh, so uh, yeah, and there is other case where he also paid uh, uh, to uh, through a, a Playboy, Playboy, this uh, a model, uh, Karen is the name. So uh, he paid uh, to uh, Stormy Daniels uh, roughly around around one hundred thirty thousand dollars. Yeah. Uh, so and, and he said that this was uh, paid to the lawyer. And yes, all the details have been in the public domain for a while. It's just that uh, you're saying that uh, it will be inconvenient for Donald Trump to be appearing in person, uh, you know, while he has to uh, sort of uh, lead a campaign in his favor throughout uh, the country. But uh, there are others who believe that uh, Donald Trump could use this opportunity as he's been using uh, uh, such similar opportunities in the past as well to make uh, the kind of case that he's been making, that he's being victimized and still reach out to his base. The question re remains as to whether this will put off those who are still undecided and uh, those who are not as committed to him even among the Republicans. Do you think that is a fair uh, assessment to make? Uh, Trump has said very clearly that it's a political witch hunt. Uh, he has uh, pleaded not guilty in the case of Hashmani. Uh, he is saying that you know uh, this. Uh, the other parties are trying to use. Uh, they are trying to weaponize the court system and the legal system uh, to kind of you know put him in, in a very politically disadvantageous position. But as far as Trump's voters are concerned, let me tell you that his uh, his uh, base voters from the Republican uh, side uh, they will continue to support him. And he has a number of occasions when he was being indicted last year. So he has used the courtroom to uh, for 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 his you know uh, for for his claim that uh, he's uh, a victim of this the liberal side. He has been indicted on all charges because he's running for the president. And in after every indictment, his support increased. Uh, so I do not think that uh, there'll be change in his as far as the base voters are concerned. They'll continue to support uh, Trump irrespective of you know whether he is uh, convicted or not. Uh, some changes might take place in the independent voters in the battleground states. There are, there are about six or seven uh, battleground states uh, where independent voters are not yet decided. So in those states, there might be some swing in, the, in voting in case he is sent to the prison. But otherwise, you know, Trump, in my view, even today, uh, he, has, uh, he is leading in a number of places. Uh, even in the battleground states, he is uh, doing pretty well vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, this uh, President Biden. Uh, so uh, his uh, voters will not change, uh, uh, no, uh, they'll continue to support Trump uh, without any doubt. Okay, let's see in the course of the trial if uh, there are more embarrassing revelations, although I don't know to what extent is that a possibility uh, things might change. Uh, but uh, for the moment, thank you so much for joining us, Professor. Let's now take you live across uh, to the United States where uh, we just uh, informed you about a bizarre incident taking place in Maryland in Baltimore. Uh, Baltimore Mayor Brandon Scott now has said that he's aware of the incident and is en route to the Key Bridge site, adding that is also in contact with officials there. Baltimore City Fire Department has described the collapse 
of a mass casualty. It's been described as a mass casualty incident and said workers have been searching for seven people in the river. Meanwhile, efforts to rescue those affected are underway as well. The 1.6 mile, that is 2.57 kilometer long Francis Scott Key Bridge in Maryland's Baltimore in the U.S. collapsed in the early hours of Tuesday after a container ship hit it directly head on as you can see in these images. Now let's get you the latest on what's happening in India in the run-up to the world's largest democratic election as well. Now, as the campaigning for the 2024 general elections is gaining momentum, controversies have started to uh, come forth in Galol. Congress's senior leader, Supriya Shunate, made derogatory comments against actor and now BJP candidate from Himachal Pradesh's Mandi seat, Kangnara North, which have led to a political backlash against the Congress party. The BJP is hit out at the Congress, terming Shunate's Instagram post as bringing out the mindset of the Congress and what they think about women. Several senior leaders of the BJP have condemned these uh, derogatory remarks made by Supriya Shunate against Kangana Ranaut. However, the Congress is on the back foot and is trying to salvage the situation. It's uh, said uh, that uh, it was a parody account that uh, made the comment against the BJP's candidate. मैं एक अभिनेत्री हूं और अभिनेत्री होने के कारण या जो भी किसी भी महिला का कोई भी चाहे उनका व्यवसाय हो कोई भी उनका काम हो पेशा हो हर महिला चाहे वो टीचर हो चाहे वो एक्ट्रेस हो चाहे वो जर्नलिस्ट हो चाहे वो राजनीतिज्ञ हो या वो चाहे सेक्स वर्कर हो किसी भी तरह तरीके की जो महिला है वो डिग्निटी जो है वो डिजर्व करती हैं और किसी भी महिला को अपमानित करना उसके आई मीन यू नो सेक्सुअलाइज करना और खासकर सबसे ज़्यादा जो मुझे दुख हुआ है वो जो मंडी जिसे छोटा काशी कहा जाता है पूरे विश्व में छोटे काशी के नाम से प्रसिद्ध है जहाँ पे ऋषि पराशर से लेकर ऋषि मार्कंडेय जी ने तपस्या की है उसके बारे में इतनी भद्दी टिप्पणी तो हम सब मंडी वासी जो हैं वो बहुत ही कष्ट हमें हुआ है इस चीज़ को and the BJP on Tuesday announced that the party would contest the upcoming Lok Sabha elections alone and would not form an alliance with the Shirmani Akali Dal in Punjab. Bharatiya Janata Party's Punjab chief Sunil Jhakar announced the decision saying that the decision was taken on the basis of the opinion of the people and party workers in Punjab. Core committee meeting of the, the Janata Dal Secular party is underway at the state president H.T. Kumaraswamy's residence. The JDS is all set to release its list of candidates contesting the looks by elections from the state. The regional party is contesting the election in alliance with the BJP in Karnataka. The Saffron party has declared nominees for 20 seats and according to sources it's expected to announce the names of the remaining five seats in a day or two. Polling for looks by elections will be held in Karnataka in two phases that is the 26th of next month and the 7th of May. Let me now take you across to DD India's Bendu model for more on these uh, political developments that have been taking place. Uh, the Bendu, uh, quite a few significant ones are happening today. One is uh, the furor over the Congress leader's remarks about Kangana Ranaut, I believe uh, even after the Congress has tried to backtrack from it saying it was a, uh, an account, uh, a, a parody account uh, of uh, Supriya Shrinate that uh, made that comment, uh, it's just that uh, these, uh, I this issue is not dying down anytime soon. Uh, well, Gautam, that's absolutely right. You know, the, the issue uh, which, uh, you know, has uh, had erupted last evening uh, after a tweet, uh, in fact, an Instagram post went out 
uh, from senior Congress leader uh, Shupriya Shinate's uh, Instagram account, uh, which was derogatory uh, in a sense against uh, the BJP's Mandi candidate Kangana Ranawat. Uh, you know, the, the BJP is keeping the pot boiling because, uh, you know, the BJP is clear on the fact uh, that, uh, you know, they do not want uh, any women to be uh, uh, called or termed as something at, uh, as which a, a woman uh, leader of the Congress has termed Kangana Ranawat. Uh, it was absolutely derogatory is what the BJP has been saying. Uh, the BJP is also expected to raise this issue with the Election Commission of India. Uh, a delegation of uh, three senior members of the BJP is uh, likely to meet the Election Commission uh, at 4 p.m. this evening. However, uh, the main agenda of the meeting with the Election Commission uh, which uh, uh, by the BJP, which will be headed by Union Minister Ashwini Vaishnav and also senior leaders like Vinod Taude, uh, from the Congress, uh, you know, will be uh, will be taking up the issue uh, of uh, you know M K Stalin, uh, as well as uh, you know the Karnataka's uh, minister uh, calling uh, names uh, to Narendra Modi. Uh, you know, this will be one of the most important issue for discussion with the Election Commission this evening when the senior delegation uh, meets with the EC. But also uh, we are being told by our sources within the BJP is that uh, the BJP is also likely to raise the issue of Kangana Ranawat uh, on, as how uh, the, uh, the Congress has used derogatory comments against Kangana Ranawat. So of course, uh, you know, this issue will uh, will take some more time uh, before it uh, it dies down and the BJP is leaving no stone unturned uh, to, you know, to, to rake up this issue and, uh, uh, you know, to, to go to the people and uh, say that, you know, be, uh, the Congress is in fact uh, anti-women and the BJP is protecting the rights of the women. So, of course, uh, this issue will be, uh, will be burning for quite some time now, it seems. Yes, and the other big uh, development is the BJP's uh, announcement uh, that is going it alone in Punjab and uh, uh, not with anybody else, uh, even past partners, Akari Dal, with uh, whom they were in talks with. How significant is that? Oh, well, uh, Gautam, of course, you know, the, uh, if you remember, the BJP has already uh, put out the list of almost 400 candidates uh, from all the places that, is going to, that it is going to contest, uh, which consists of about 90% of the list uh, of the seats that the BJP would contest. Uh, it was only Punjab that was left uh, by the BJP uh, uh, to declare the nominated candidates from that particular state, and negotiations were underway for quite some time now, uh, but it seems that uh, we just got news uh, this afternoon afternoon uh, saying that the, uh, that the talks with the Shiromani Akali Dal, the BJP's uh, erstwhile partner, uh, has fallen and uh, the BJP is likely to contest all alone in the state of Punjab. Uh, so, of course, uh, there will be, uh, there will be a, a, a meeting on Punjab uh, at the BJP headquarters uh, in, the coming, uh, in the coming few days and the BJP CEC will, fi will now uh, able, uh, will be able to decide on the, uh, on the entire uh, list of candidates that the BJP is likely to field uh, from Punjab. So, of course, uh, you know, this is significant development because the BJP uh, has not uh, fought election uh, all by its uh, all by itself uh, till date in Punjab and this will perhaps be the first time that the BJP will be contesting uh, in Punjab all by itself. So of course yes. uh, this is a significant development. Uh, we'll have to see uh, you know how the BJP fares uh, when, uh, when it is going all alone uh, in the state of Punjab uh, given the fact that you know uh, this is a crucial state uh, for the BJP as well. All right. Uh, when you receive it there at the moment uh, and uh, now talk about what's happening with Indian politician K. Kavita. Well, she's been sent to jail till the 9th of April after her custody with the Enforcement Directorate ended today. Her plea of interim bail will be heard on the 1st of April. She was arrested by the Central Agency on charges of being a key conspirator and beneficiary of the Delhi Excise Policy scam. Delhi Chief Minister Arvind Kejriwal, who was also arrested by the ED in the excise case, is in custody till the 28th of this month. Let's now give you a quick look at some of the other updates coming in from around the country. The Indian Coast Guard organized a walkathon with Philippines' Coast Guard to promote the Puneet Sagar Abhiyan, an outreach program to clean sea shores of plastic and other waste material. The walkathon was followed up uh, with a cleanup of the Dolomite Beach. The Sikh community in India is marking Hola Mohalla, a three day long Sikh festival. In this celebration, youth perform Gatka, a martial art at the Anandpur Sahib Gurdwara in Punjab.
नानकी जी के नाम के ऊपर the Institute for Human Development in partnership with international labor organizations as the ILO has prepared a report on India Employment 2024. The report based on youth employment, education and skills was launched by Anantha Nageshwaran, the chief economic advisor to the government of India in Delhi on Tuesday. DD India's Bashal Baristo has spoken with Dr. Nageshwaran to find out more about the report. The India Employment Report 2024 is out and I have with me the Chief Economic Advisor to the Government of India, Dr. Nageshwaran. Let's talk to him and find out. Uh, Dr. Nageshwaran, first of all, what is your reaction on the report? Does it bring smile on your face? No, it does because the report has acknowledged that, for example, there is returns to education and several employment indicators have improved between 2019 and 22 despite the pandemic. There is higher enrollment of women in education and, uh, and the report also has acknowledged uh, many initiatives that the government has taken including skilling, apprenticeship initiatives and in terms of creation of physical infrastructure which is one of the prerequisites for manufacturing growth to happen. So the report, uh, while it covers the issue of employment in great detail with lots of data and analysis and surveys. It also acknowledges the improvements on the positive developments that have taken place in the Indian labor market and also correctly credits many of the government initiatives for contributing to that improvement. And India that aspires to become the third largest economy, so how do the two correlate? No, absolutely. I mean, look, uh, we have a demographic advantage which is supposed to last for another 25, 30 years. And uh, the new education policy, as I mentioned in my remarks, it's a very futuristic document. It um, understands the challenges that will come for employment generation from new technology developments. And therefore, it provides flexibility to the youth to kind of mix and match their skills such a way that they don't become overly concentrated, in which case it is easy to, be re it is easy to replace them with machines. So one last question. As you rightly said that the diagnosis is easier than a solution. So at this stage, uh, what are the challenges that need to be taken care of? I mean, the important thing is uh, Indian private sector has to invest. In, in real assets. I mean, as I mentioned, the second decade was a decade which investment, in which investment rate declined because of balance sheet problems. The, therefore, private sector making investments in capital formation will be an important uh, prerequisite for jobs to be created. So there you heard the chief economic advisor. He is uh, quite a contented lot. But yes, the private sector and the academia can play a very crucial role if India is to become the third largest economy. Vishal Beristu for DD India, Delhi. Japan's government on Tuesday relaxed military equipment export restrictions to allow future overseas sales of an advanced jet fighter it's developing along with Britain and Italy. The rule change affects only cabinet approved jet fighter exports and it will only apply to 15 countries that have defense agreements with Tokyo. These 15 countries commit to settle international disputes peacefully in accordance with the United Nations Charter. Meanwhile, export to countries in conflicts will still not be allowed under the latest rules. The Central Bank of Sri Lanka slashed interest rates by 50 basis points on Tuesday. The decision was made to stimulate growth amidst the island country's worst financial crisis in decades. Despite a temporary uptick in inflation due to a VAT hike earlier this year, the Central Bank remains confident in its medium-term inflation outlook. CBSL reduced the standing deposit facility rate to 8.5% and the standing lending facility rate to 9.5%, catching markets off guard. CBSL Governor Dr. Nandalal Virasinghe emphasized that there is room for further monetary easing if inflation remains stable between 4 to 5%. The decision brings total interest rate cuts to 700 basis points since last year. That's about 7%. By lowering rates, CBSL aims to maintain inflation at the targeted level of 5% while propelling the economy forward. Sri Lanka recorded inflation at 5.9% in the month of February 2024. And Sri Lanka faced the peak of its worst ever economic crisis in 2022 when it defaulted on the external debt commitments. With Indian assistance unlocking of financial package from the International Monetary Fund and tight monetary policy measures, Inflation was brought down to single digit late last year.
Also, the Sri Lankan government has secured a $100 million loan in a deal signed with the Asian Development Bank. The agreement aims to provide vital financial assistance to revive the island's small and medium-sized enterprises sector, which constitutes over 75% of all its businesses. Sri Lanka's SMEs have been grappling with the aftermath of the COVID-19 pandemic and the economic slowdown. Sri Lanka plans to allocate $50 million from the loan towards an SME line of credit scheme, streamlining access to finance for struggling enterprises. And it's time now to get you all the supporting updates as well. And uh, all the supporting news that is coming in from Mark Lin. Well, thanks a lot, uh, Gautam. And let's uh, start with uh, the IPL. And Chennai Super Kings are all set to take on Gujarat Titans in their next battle of IPL on Tuesday in Chennai. And both teams have already played once this season and won their respective games. CSK beat Royal Challengers Bengaluru by six wickets, while GT got the better of Mumbai Indians by six runs. Chennai Super Kings are currently ranked second on the points table, while Gujarat Titans are currently ranked fourth on the basis of points. And uh, both teams last played each other. Uh, in the final of the Indian Premier League in 2023, Chennai Super Kings were crowned champions after they defeated Gujarat Titans by five wickets. But in the five matches played between these two sides, Gujarat Titans have a better record, having won three of the games and losing two. And Virat Kohli, uh, uh, he, uh, he shepherded uh, Royal Challengers Bengaluru to a four-wicket win over of a Punjab Kings in Bengaluru on Monday night, chasing 177. Kohli made the most of an early reprieve when uh, he was yet to open his account. And the Indian star then scored 77 to set the platform for RCB to get off, to the, get off uh, the mark in this tournament. Dinesh Karthik and uh, the impact player Mahipal Lamroor, they uh, provided the finishing touches at the death to take RCB over the line with four balls to spare. Punjab bowlers Harshar Patel, uh, Sam Curran and Ashdeep Singh, they wilted under pressure. Earlier, RCB managed to keep a lid on Punjab scoring all through the power play. Pacer Yash Dayal was impressive, hitting the right length and getting movement both ways. Skipper Shikhar Dhawan top scored with 45 while the other batters made valuable contributions to take the visitors to a modest total of 176 for the loss of six wickets. It was a very close match and pretty good and exciting. And in the process, Virat Kohli notched up his 150-plus score in T20 cricket uh, during the Royal Challengers Bengaluru's IPL match against Punjab Kings. In Bengaluru, Kohli got a reprieve, as we said, on zero. But uh, he made the most of that chance and reached his half-century which was his 51st in IPL, the T20, in T20 cricket. Kohli has scored eight centuries and 92 fifties. Of these, uh, one century and 37 fifties have come from international matches. Chris Gale leads this list with 110 50-plus scores in the format, closely followed by David Warner in second place with 109 such scores to his name. Kohli is in the third position. The Indian senior men's team will uh, look to grab full points as they take on Afghanistan. We're talking about football now in the FIFA World Cup 2026 and AFC Asian Cup 2027 preliminary joint qualification round two on Tuesday in Gauhati. In their previous meeting just four days ago, the Blue Tigers were held to a goalless draw by Afghanistan on Saudi Arabian soil. They moved up to second place in the four-team Group A as uh, Qatar beat Kuwait 3-0 on the same day. But on home soil, India have netted 16 goals in the last 12 matches. After three matches, uh, they played each other. Yes. And uh, that's it then, uh, Gautam. We've got a whiff of what the sports news was like. Uh, did you watch that match between RCB and... Uh, oh, yeah, I did. It was an exciting one. Good to see Kohli uh, getting those runs and getting to his uh, 150 in uh, T20s altogether. Today is another exciting one. In the evening, I'll uh, be sure to watch it. Now, that's all we have uh, for this edition of DD10 News Hour as well. But let you know that... Let us know your thoughts on the day and uh, you can let us know that on uh, Facebook, X as well as Instagram. We'll be back with more news and updates as a break here on DD India. I'm Gautam Roy from all of us here in Delhi. Thanks a lot for watching DD India News Hour.